UFO disclosure from the Canadian government. Recent article, May 1st, on Before Us News. Canadian government authorized open public access to thousands of federal government documents concerning UFOs. It's a total of over 9,500 digitized documents spanning the years 1947 to the early 1980s and have been made available through the Library and Archives Canada website titled Canada's UFOs, The Search for the Unknown. That's the title of it. The Federal Government of Canada, The Search for the Unknown, Canada's UFOs. The files include correspondence, reports, memos, and procedures, some of which specifically deal with UFOs. The files come from Canada's National Defense Department, Department of Transportation, and National Research Council, and the Royal Canadian Mountie, the Mounties, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I used to live in Canada. I used to live in Montreal. And uh, there was one site, uh, well, they, we used to live in a, a cul-de-sac, and we used to go bicycle riding every afternoon with our friends. Beautiful for children to go around there, you know, hardly any cars in the neighborhood. And we saw something that I believe was a UFO. It was above an electrical tower. We had a forest at the end of the cul-de-sac and an electrical tower there. And it was just, uh, as we were going round and round, we noticed this thing up there, right above the electrical tower. And uh, it wasn't making any noise. It was not a helicopter. It was not a, a, a hot air balloon. It wasn't, it wasn't anything except something of a, a space vehicle that was sitting on top of the electrical tower. I don't know if it was observing us or if it was just uh, collecting energy or just resting there. It wasn't making any noise. It was not... Uh, uh, well, it was definitely very clearly seen. It was afternoon in the summer. And uh, we were going around and around, and uh, every time we'd go around, it would take about 10, 15 minutes, and it was still there. And when we realized what it was, we just had, had you know, tuck our, tuck our tails in and just uh, went home. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, this was, when was this? This was about, must have been 19, about 1970. Uh, this falls in the time period of what they see here in 1947 to 1980s. And this was um, clearly, you know, our, our uh, experience of it. Uh, they seem to be in areas that are uh, uh, not densely populated as was our area. Uh, when I lived in Canada at the time, there was only 10 million people there, the whole, the, the whole country. I think now it's 30. Um, so yeah, they have this uh, freedom of information now. Search for the unknown files, including correspondence from even the Mounties. Canada's release of its uh, UFO X files follows closely to the release at the end of January of Denmark's UFO files. Britain continues to release thousands of UFO files through a program of gradual releases. It began in May 2007 through its national archives, with the most recent being October 2008. The French Space Agency earlier announced March 22, 2007, it was making public its secret UFO files through the government website. Uh, there are many other countries, I think even Russia has done that, the important difference between the released Canadian UFO files with other country releases is the inclusion of the departmental analysis rather than simple reports of the UFO sightings. I mean, it's one thing just saying, you know, I, Mary Smith, saw a UFO, and it's another thing having I, Mary Smith, saw a UFO and having the, uh, the government's uh, examination report on that. So well, that's an important difference. According to Victor Vigiani from Exopolitics Toronto, who has been monitoring the Canadian government UFO website since its inception, the Canadian files do not simply list UFO sightings. They describe actions, meetings, and interdepartmental memoranda generated by Canadian officials that attempt to make sense of the considerable onslaught of UFO sightings as well as referencing American problems with keeping abreast of UFO sightings. 
How would they reference that? I'd like to know. Now, for example, September 1967, memo titled Unidentified Flying Objects Investigations, UFOs Investigations, was released which stated, a number of investigations of the report suggest the possibility of UFOs exhibiting some unique scientific information or advanced technology which could possibly contribute to scientific or technical research. Another memo details a UFO sighting at Shag Harbor witnessed by a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and six civilian witnesses on the night of October 4th, 1967. The memo describes how witnesses reported seeing an object 60 feet in length moving in an easterly direction before it descended rapidly into the water, making a bright splash on impact. The report continued, a single white light appeared on the surface of the water for a short period of time. The RCMP, that's RCMP is short for Royal Canadian Mounted Police, with help from local fishermen and their boats, endeavored to reach the object before it sank completely. Undoubtedly, the most significant documents are those associated with the 1950s to 1952 classified investigation and analysis of UFOs by the Department of Transportation team led by Wilbert Smith, a senior radio engineer. In his project, Magnet Report, Smith commented extensively on the flight performance of UFOs that were far in advance to anything known at the time. And I would venture to say even now they're far advanced in anything we know. Now it's difficult to reconcile this performance with the capabilities of our technology. And unless a technology of some terrestrial nation is much more advanced than is generally known, we're forced to the conclusion that the vehicles are probably extraterrestrial in spite of our prejudices to the contrary. While not all of the information made available through the Canadian archives is completely new to UFO researchers, it does provide a comprehensive online archive for the public and media to scrutinize the Canadian government UFO X-Files. Canada first began to release UFO files through its archive in October 2007, and these have quickly increased to its present level of 9,500 files. That's only up to the, um, what, the that's only up the period 67 to uh, to what to 80 something when was it to eight to the 1980s so you can imagine how many more there are from the 1980s up to now almost an, another uh, uh, three a 30 year period um, so the Canadian Canada first began to release UFO files through its archive October 2007 and uh, to the presence level of 9,500 files. So I clicked on the link, Canada's UFOs, the search for the unknown. It says here, this, this is the image from it, from the banner of it. It's got this UFO with windows on top. This database provides access to about 9,500 digitized documents from our government records collection. These documents include reports, sightings, and investigations of UFOs across Canada. It says here, important notice, if you search using only the field sighting date or location, you may obtain partial results, and only if this information appears on the original document itself. Use a variety of search strategies in order to achieve more search results. Most of the original documents were written in English. Use English keywords in the document title or location fields to increase results. And you can read more, it says here, about when government departments became involved in investigating UFOs in the timeline, about selected UFO sightings in Canada and map locations, about the government record collections on the thematic guide. Let me remind you that the former Defence Minister of Canada, Paul Hellyer, for decades now has been, he's still alive by the way, I believe, um, he's been uh, revealing the fact that uh, we have extraterrestrial UFOs on Earth, uh, all over the place, and uh, also ETs among us. And uh, he goes along, he goes around giving lectures concerning disclosure. And um, Canada is not, a, well, let me just, go, let's just go and pick a location. Okay, here we are, we're still in the, 
uh, Canada uh, UFO uh, website. Let's go, sect, it says here map locations, that's what I clicked on. And I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to go to, uh, what about Montreal? It has a map here by location, let's zoom in. I'm going to go to Quebec, because that's where I was in, a, in Montreal. And I want to see if they have anything in Montreal, if they saw anything in Montreal. Let's see, going closer and closer. Um, there seems to be a lot in Northwest Territory, Manitoba, Alberta, Nova Scotia. What else? That's it? Okay. Where shall I go? Let's go to uh, something called Falcon Lake, Manitoba, May 20th, 1967. Stephen McKellick, oh, I've missed it, where is it? Stephen McKellick set out to prospect trip Falcon Lake, Manitoba, May 19th, 1967, just as he would have for any other trip. He packed his equipment and his wife packed him a lunch for the next day's work. He arrived at the lake approximately 9.30 p.m., checked into a motel. He would later report to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, that he went for a coffee at the motel's beverage room. On the morning of May 20th, McCallick awoke early in the morning, began prospecting in the area he later attempted to keep secret. After a morning of work in the, the bushes around Falcon Lake, he came across a flock of geese, typical scene for a rural in Manitoba, sat down at 11 a.m. to have his lunch. It was the ruckus caused by the keys that first caught McCulloch's attention. When he looked up, there were two flying saucers directly in front of him. According to his statement to the RCMP, he knelt in amazement before the two objects. One of the objects landed about 100 feet in front of him, while the other hovered about 10 feet off the ground. McCulloch estimated the size of the hovering object to be about 30 feet in diameter. Related documents, interviews of May 24th, I'm not going to PDF, I'm not going to read that. He says here, the first object remained on the ground for 45 minutes. It made a whirling sound and gradually changed in color from gray to silver. Then a hatch opened and the object emitted a bright violet light. McCulloch claimed that he heard voices from within. He called out to the voices in English, German, Italian, Polish, Ukrainian, and Russian. He called out. I guess these were the, these were the uh, languages that he knew. There was no response. Instead, the hatch closed quickly as if the inhabitants were spooked. McCulloch reached out and touched the object as it began to revolve and take off, and he was instantly pushed back by a force of hot air. The blast burned his clothes and left marks on his chest. After he ripped off his clothing, McCulloch fell ill. He began to vomit and notice a metallic smell coming from inside his body, like the burning smell of an electric wire or an electric motor. Feeling worse by the minute, McCulloch headed towards the highway where he managed to flag down an RCMP car. McCulloch refused medical treatment from the officer at the time, but later went back to the RCMP detachment for office, asked for a doctor. Upon learning that there were no doctors in the area, he caught a bus back to Winnipeg. When McCulloch returned home, his son took him to the hospital. He did not tell the doctor the burns were caused by an unidentified flying object, a UFO, but rather by airplane exhaust. McCulloch also consulted his family doctor about his loss of appetite since the ordeal he had experienced rapid weight loss. On May 26, 1967, that's about six days later, McCulloch was interviewed by C.J. Davis of the RCMP. His report describes the burn marks visible on McCulloch's chest, a large burn that covers an area approximately a foot in diameter the burn was blotchy and with unburned areas inside the burn perimeter area. Again, I'm not going to the uh, PDF areas. Now, uh, I go on with the report. By this time, the authorities had become very interested in the case. There were aspects of McCulloch's story that were difficult to explain, such as the burns on his body. The RCMP wanted to find the landing site to investigate further. They first attempted to find the site on their own on May 31st, but were unsuccessful. On June 1st, 1967, McCulloch was brought to Falcon Lake to lead another search. McCulloch could not find the site, causing increased speculation about the validity of his claim. 
The RCMP uncovered another discrepancy in his story. McCulloch had reported that he went for coffee the night before the alleged sighting, but the bartender at the Falcon Lake Motel beverage room claimed to have served McCulloch bottles of beer, not coffee. Okay, still. The RCMP decided to close the case until McCulloch could locate the landing site. On June 26, however, the case reopened. McCulloch claimed to have found the site on his own and recovered objects he left there, pieces of his burnt clothing, steel tape, and some rocks and soil samples. RCMP squad leader Bisky visited McCulloch the evening of June 26, obtaining samples of soil brought back from location. The soil samples, along with samples of clothing and the steel tape, were sent to be tested for radioactive material. About a month later, July 24th, the results of the test were sent to the RCMP along with the memo that stated UFO reported by Stephen McCulloch. The proprietary tests here indicate earth samples taken from the scene highly radioactive. Radiation Protective Division of Department of Health and Welfare concerns that others may be exposed if travel in the area is not restricted. I mean, that's how high of radiation it was. A second laboratory test was sent to RCMP July 25th. It stated the Department of Health and Welfare would be sending a representative to Mr. Hunt to Winnipeg to investigate. On the evening of July 27th, the colleague was visited by Hunt, squad leader Bisky, and C.J. Davis, who explained the laboratory findings of radioactive material. McCulloch agreed to take them to the landing site on the following day, July 28th. The group walked to the location in the afternoon reported the scene to be bare of evidence except for a semicircle on the rock face, a 15 foot, foot in diameter where the moss had been somehow removed. Mr. Hunt found traces of radiation in a fault in the rock across the center of the landing spot. No trace of radiation was found around the outer perimeter of the circle or in the moss uh, on the, in the moss or grass below the raised portion of the rock. The radioactive ma ma material found in the rock fault was radium-226. It's an isotope in wide commercial use and also found in nuclear reactor waste. In view of the small quantity of soil contamination, Mr. Hunt determined that there was no danger to humans traveling in the area. The Department of National Defense identifies the Falcon Lake case as unsolved. Stephen McCulloch wrote a book about his experience but claimed to never have financially benefited from his ordeal. So there's so many of these things here. I just picked out one at random. Okay, this is a picture of the burns from the UFO that McCullough sustained. And uh, this was, as I told you, this was one of the first cases I picked at the Canadian UFO site. And little I, didn't I know that the Falcon Lake that we just talked about was one of the uh, most well-known UFO cases of Canada. And uh, as I told you, I picked it at random. And it's still an unsolved case. And I wonder how many more of these... Uh, I will be reading them once in a while uh, because they are fascinating and they're given out. This information is uh, disclosed by the Canadian government. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on, not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today more of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.